Hi everyone. So this video is on how to spot an SJW Marvel book and to tell it apart from, let's just say, a normal book. I call Marvel SJW Marvel because I believe I've got a lot of evidence that they've been completely infested and infected with SJW ideology and that also that this is top down. This is not something that younger or newer writers are slipping past the goalie. This is an atmosphere created from the very top and it's encouraged and they actually actively recruit people whose sole laurels to recruit them are being big SJWs on Twitter or Tumblr. But first of all, I have to define SJW because some people don't know what it means and actually several people have asked what it means. SJW stands for Social Justice Warrior and it was created ironically and sarcastically to deal with people that were kind of bubbling up in a lot of different areas in geek culture video games, sci-fi, and comics. These people are basically professional troublemakers, but it's more than just that. They clothe themselves in the guise of virtue in order to get attention, get jobs, destroy other people. There's a lot of destroying, and that's what one of the things that I'll bring up, that SJW is about destroying. It's not really about creating. They, they don't create anything lasting. It's actually been somewhat co-opted by people who are SJWs because they take it on face value and they get this very like, it's very comical. They're like, something's wrong with social justice or they're like, I'm proud to be a social justice warrior. The point is you're not doing anything. You're basically tackling trifles and then you act like you're fighting Boko Haram and like rescuing girls. You're not doing anything. Look for stuff to get angry about and then you pat yourself on the back for a non-accomplishment. And basically it's very destructive. It hasn't led to any good books. I, was, uh, I had a video idea where I was going to say, these two characters are good SJW characters. And then I realized they're not SJW characters. They're just minority heroes. But the, so many of the SJ characters are minority heroes that it almost gives all of them a bad rap. To, the next point is, I used to say SJW for everything, and now I'm realizing that SJW, it is an ideology, but in comics, it's only the stories. You can be an artist who's the biggest SJW ever, like Erica Henderson, if you follow her on Twitter, before she blocks you for not agreeing with her. But if she's paired with an artist that's just trying to tell a regular story, she'll just tell a regular story. It's hard to convey SJW ideology if you're only the artist and you're not at least the co-writer. Then the other thing is that you say, oh, this guy is an SJW writer. And yet there are guys like Bendis who can be a huge SJW. And then he'll also do stuff that's just a straight good story. I mean, this whole Daredevil run. Um, it was kind of before the whole SJW fad. I'm hoping it's a fad. Uh, if you go read his Daredevil stuff, it's solid as a rock. And there's, there's no hint of any of these uh, weird proclivities he's hewn to recently. Then I was like, well, there's SJW characters. Isn't, for in instance, America an SJW character? And yet, I haven't read it, but people have been telling me, when she first came out, she was but she was a good like team member. She was on a couple of team books, and she was fun. And she wasn't the cartoon two-dimensional cliche she is now. So I was like, oh, okay, so now that's another thing that I, can I can't say there's SJW characters because any of these SJW characters written by a legitimate artist or, you know, a writer who's actually trying to tell a story, it finally came down to there are only SJW stories. What effectively happens is that these are non-stories. These are usually just speeches or attacks Sometimes very transparently on like their Twitter enemies, <laughs> like literally they'll waste an entire comic just zinging and it's the, the life cycle of comics, it takes like six months. So they're effectively doing a clap back to something that happened six months ago, which is a colossal waste of time. And that's one of the reasons people kind of drop these books. So, okay, getting into the list of how to spot an SJW Marvel story. First of all, there are low or no stakes. A lot of these issues are entirely dialogue. Not even dialogue and drama. Sometimes they're literally just people talking. I've made this joking uh, reference to a Brian Michael Bendis action scene. And a Brian Michael Bendis action scene is two people talking on the phone and then one of them flies to speak to the other person in person. 
Um, I've read entire uh, issues of Miles Morales where literally nothing happened except for some conversations in different rooms. And sometimes there'll be like a little build up, you know, like there'll be a mysterious person in a limo and that window goes down. But that is it. Sometimes there will be someone threatening someone else, but uh, it'll never actually be action. Th that same issue I'm re referencing to, like a teacher came out and like told the person in the limo to go away. It was like it's like fifty five year old like probably administrator or something like that, and I was like, oh, that was the action scene <laughs> for this four dollar book about a guy with, you know superpowers built around fighting that he didn't use. That leads into villains that are either purposefully portrayed as jokes or are defeated very easily. Now, there's a trope in and even in action like TV shows is that you will start the show showing the hero doing really good. They'll beat a mid-range villain, and then they'll be kind of proud of themselves, and that's when Venom comes. And so they, they get wrecked, and they're like, oh man, I've been fighting Pace Pot Pete and thought I was good, and Venom came out of the woodwork and he stole my lunch money right in front of my girlfriend. This is so embarrassing. Then they've got to rise to the occasion. Hero stories are about rising to the occasion. It's about getting beat down into the ground, and that's very literally in comics a lot of the time. Literally damaging the, you know the macadam of the street and then you literally rise and you fight and you defeat that guy and that's that's where all the you know the emotional um weight of comics come from because then that leads to being symbolism for more normal struggles that the reader goes through but in sjw comics they feel like the audience and the character cannot handle real struggles so they will basically give them softball conflicts and very easy fights. Characters are usually con commenting on how it was so easy and they did so good. This leads into the next one. Constant emotional validation. In my uh, review of Fury Williams' Iron Man, I pointed out how while she fought a... Actually, people are arguing that Will of the Wisp is not a Z-grade or C-grade. He actually has kind of a silly look, but he's very powerful. Anyway, she fought him in a completely incompetent manner that endangered the lives of tens of thousands of people. And then when she woke up, she had this almost like a literal Greek chorus that was, of course, all women. And all they were doing was just singing her praises. I want you to imagine something opposite. Spider-Man. Uh, one time he got these Captain Universe powers, which like really amped him up into like a cosmic hero. Let's say the same scene, and then he gets knocked out, and then he wakes up. The first thing, he would have woken up, and it would have been like Nick Fury there, and Nick Fury would have been reading him the riot act, and then threatening, use a ray to steal his powers or to put him in jail. He would literally say, I'm going to put you in jail for being an endangerment. Or the other thing is another male hero would have been there and he would have said something that would have been nice but would have like cut Spider-Man like down to his heart. He would have said, hey buddy, let me handle the really tough villains because I've got more experience. And both of those would have set up Spider-Man to prove himself, either to his buddy who kind of like passive aggressively put him down or to an older authority figure like Nick Fury. And then he, he you know, maybe would have got a grudging little bit of respect. With SJW stories, the character is never in doubt of being respected. The character is always respected and constantly emotionally validated. In old Marvel, Marvel for the most of its history, the only emotional validation came from the title. <laughs> you know, the only person who called Spider-Man amazing was the guy who lettered the logo. Spider-Man was behind the eight ball. Pretty much every Marvel hero was constantly being insulted, pilloried, and if they were ever beloved by like the public, it was just setting them up for a fall. That scene with Invincible Iron Man, if you would have done the scene, same scene with Spider-Man or Iron Man being cooed over and emotionally validated, you would have said, these people are scrolls. These people are LMDs. These people are clones. I am so nervous. Why is this man being emotionally validated and spoken to like he's a child? Something is up. This doesn't match how they're always treated. Riri Williams is treated as if she's a five-year-old with uh, severe emotional problems and just anything will make her, her crumble into tears at any moment. Next for SJW is lectures. A lot of SJW stories, like I mentioned earlier, are just the writer lecturing readers in general or doing like a 
hyper focused <laughs> six months later response to something on social media that bothered them. Now, older school, I mean, especially like in the 50s and 60s, but even into the 80s with like the J.M. DeMatteis, Captain America, at the end, Cap would usually give a speech. And actually, Mark Wade did this fairly well. One of the big speeches about the, the no you move speech, that came from Mark Wade comic in the 90s. The thing about these speeches is, first of all, they were a lot less cringy, but also they were speeches to a character in the comic who had done something wrong or who was misunderstood. Nowadays, the speeches go on forever. Sometimes they are effectively the entire comic, and they are directed at the reader. The reader is wrong. The reader is not woke. By the way, some people are asking me what woke. Woke is like this funny phrase originally used seriously, and now it's basically been turned around just to mock people who think like that. So it's like the, the writer considers themselves woke, and they're, quote, educating audience, or they're upbraiding them for you know the, what their perceived backward notions are this leads to, into all the other things it's like you can't tell a good story if your whole point is just to lecture the reader also it's really hard to tell a good story if you obviously hate the reader and there's several writers like like dan slott who seem to and mark wade who seem nowadays to absolutely despise the readers even guys like nick spencer you can tell he even despises like the people who like him. He's it's like a, I did a whole video on Nick Spencer's not a writer. He's a con man and a good one. Whereas Nick Spencer wants to make money, so he tries to pump up the sales, and he's good at that. Dan Slott seems to be going for a scorched earth. You know, if he if he could get Spider Man down to fifteen thousand readers, and <laughs> he'd be fine because he'd say, well, oh, these are the only the good ones left, or something like. That. Another thing about SJW characters, I call this the census effect. There's an, I think he's an associate editor at Marvel, and his Twitter, he describes himself as being Asian, gay, and adopted. And that just jumped out at me. It's always weird when someone describes themselves as a census worker <laughs> would describe them two minutes into a sentence, not even like describing their personality. When you say, I'm gay, Asian, adopted, you didn't describe yourself. You described perhaps 10,000 people in the entire country. If I describe myself as a white college educated veteran, I didn't describe myself. I described about 40 million people and it would be very odd. So you see this, especially we saw this with America and Gabby Rivera, all she could describe her as was queer and brown. And she specifically said brown. We saw this also when I did a uh, Luke Cage number one is David Walker did this very nice essay about discovering Luke Cage as a child. All he described him as was being black. That was the only factor. If you describe characters in such vague terms, it shows that you don't really connect with them. You don't really care about them. This is just like some, it's like Peter Parker, that's one for the white team. So uh, now we got America, that's one for the brown team. It's like, it's not a team, no one cares. Falcon in the movies is really great. He's even better in the comics. Captain America is done very well. Wait, you go to any black community, you ask which two of these characters do you like more? Everyone says Captain America. Like everyone will say Captain America because he's a better character. This idea that people pick heroes based on m matching census traits that are close to them is totally Ill illegitimate. I'll probably do a whole video later about how one of my daughters is Muslim. She wears a hijab and I tried to give her Miss Marvel and she hated it and asked to cut it up to make paper dolls. She said it was boring. She likes the Flash. She likes a white, I'm assuming Flash is Christian, guy. Uh, so. People don't pick characters based on matching surface traits. My favorite characters as a teen were Night Thrasher, a black billionaire, and North Star, a gay foreigner terrorist. Former terrorist. He was actually just kind of like briefly a terrorist. Um, <laughs> but he did cheat at the Olympics, so he's got that going for him. So one of the traits about a lot of SJW stories is that the writer obviously does not know the character to the extent that they don't know basics about the character. They also don't know basics about the universe. They treat every character as if they are super girl hero person, just a generic superhero off the side of a plumber van that they just fill with whatever they want, which is inevitably their own politics. 
So Chelsea Kane was, and Marvel has done this thing recently where they've recruited people simply for SJW and census traits. They've gone, on, they've literally gone on to Twitter and find uh, people like Gabby Rivera and Saladin Ahmed with no comics experience and no actual real love of comics. And then they literally just hand them a number one of a new series. We saw this with Chelsea Kane and Mockingbird, which was a huge disaster uh, last year. I bought the first issue in good faith because I liked the character, had this excellent, um, I think it was a J. Scott Campbell cover. And I ended up finishing it and ripping it in half because it was so bad. Because the author clearly had not made it through the entire Wikipedia. This character was not a reinvention. It was basically a character, a, a person who doesn't like comics, who decided to do a comic about how she doesn't like comics and not even bother learning. Bob is not a cipher. She has a very distinct personality. She was one of the first, like, come from nowhere characters, at least in my opinion, that I really liked. She was in John Byrne's Avengers West Coast slash West Coast Avengers. He changed the title midway through his run. She came out and she was like a very cool spy, tough girl. Chelsea Kane turned her into a hateful, very jealous of men and uh, condescending towards them, science hero. Like she really pumped up her like being into science. This was never anything. Bob Drake was basically the type of girl that if superheroes didn't exist, she would have gone and been a soldier or a cop. She was a tough girl. She was a tomboy. She wasn't like, oh, I get x-rays because I hope to get radiation. I mean, I mean, if you want to just make this like a joke. But then we were supposed to take her seriously. We also saw this with Gabby Rivera. Gabby Rivera doesn't know who writes America, doesn't know basics of the modern Marvel universe. And I don't even think she read the previous issues. I think she r literally is just basing this off Queer and Brown. I think she Googled a couple things so she can reference things. But there's no love, and in fact, you actually see hatred of comics. Not only the, the fan base that they want to be a different fan base, but just all of the tropes. When they do get into fights, they're either like, uh, they're more of like, literally in America, they're dance routines, which could almost be like inventive, but when you, when you see the execution, it's really bad. The basic thing about SJW comics is that they're not comics. They're vehicles for politics. And that's why you see these stories plummet. SJW comics typically do very good on the first issue because the people who they are trying to attract are big into like posting on social media. So what you'll find is America number one comes out and there will be a ton of people buying the issue, holding it up in front of their face and saying, yeah, we did it, queer and brown, we're here to stay. But then they, like a half of them will buy issue two and by issue six, like it's ridiculous. It's basically indie comic levels with Marvel's name and Marvel's advertising budget and all of that type of stuff because there's not anything to read. I don't think anyone, even like 1600s philosophers, nobody has a very complicated political outlook. You can convey almost your entire outlook of politics in one issue. So there's nothing to come back for. You know, like, ooh, I really want, you know, a third issue about what this person thinks about Trump. Nobody has such a nuance. <laughs> Even Trump does not have a, an opinion on himself that could last for three issues. It's like you like him or you hate him or you're kind of in the middle. You know, that's one or two issues to express that. And even your broader, like your full politics about like the whole country or the world, it's not going to take that long. So most of these things, I, I used to do this joke. They had this book in the mid 90s and it was called The Wisdom of Lobo. It had this really cool Simon Bisley cover and inside was 64 blank pages. It sold cheap. I think it was like a dollar. It was a funny joke. It was actually a really uh, funny. I actually sold a lot because it was funny. The point is he's stupid, so he has no wisdom. So it's 64 blank pages. I bought it and I used it as a, a notebook uh, for years <laughs> until I filled it up. I actually probably buy another copy if I could because it's it really cool. But I always joke that you should do like three SJW comics and then just have completely blank interiors. And it's almost like tag an animal in the wild to see how far it spreads. See how viral handicapped lesbian a uh, wheelchair girl, number one, from some Twitter person you never heard of. See how many people will hold that up next to their head and say, we did it. 
<laughs> you know, we finally have a queer brown uh, wheelchair girl in a Marvel comic. And then do the ratio of things like that to these very quizzical posts like, uh, this is 22 blank. <laughs> it's like 22 blank pages and one page that advertises Eminem. I was originally planning this. I thought this was going to be all inclusive, but I guarantee there's more things I'm going to think of later. So to that end, tell me what you think that I left out. Tell me if you think the SJW trend is a fad or if it's here to stay. Because I've done other videos where I've posited the theory that Axel Alonso and Tom Brevoort have been given carte blanche to do whatever they want. It, this could go at Marvel for another five to 10 years and I think that they'll just blame the low sales on the industry as a whole. But tell me what you think about my theories in this. Tell me what I left out. Tell me what you think is absolutely wrong. Are there any books that you can say, this is an SJW story, but I still was able to enjoy it as a story? Oh, I forgot one other. There are no SJW classics. When I'm talking about a classics, is something like the Dark Phoenix Saga. It's something like Daredevil Born Again. There are no good, these things always get like two trade paperback. That's usually why they keep them like till, you know, issue 10 or 12 because then you can get two trade paperbacks out of it. But I cannot think of a single SJW storyline that has become a classic. They are very much made only for the day they're released to either comment on or post a pic of, and then they immediately fall down the memory hole. If you can think of a classic storyline, to me a classic storyline is something that you would reprint 10 years later. When you know the novelty of Queer Brown Girl has gone away and you say, hey, that story arc where she did X was really good. We're gonna do a special trade paperback of that. So tell me if there are any SJW classics. I can't think of any. Thanks for watching, subscribe, share, and I'm gonna, <laughs> I keep promising these uh, comic reviews. They're just sitting there waiting to be reviewed, but I keep um, thinking of these like, like broader topics, which tend to be pretty popular. Actually more so than reviewing a comic, unless I have like a, a big angle on it. So thanks for watching. I'll have another video up later.